We're going to go now to the man who's head of Pelt Boxing, one of the most respected names in the sport, Jay Russell Pelt, is going to give us some of his time tonight. Welcome to the show, sir. Happy to be here. Very good. Now, uh, before we get into what's going on in the state of boxing now, I want to take a trip down memory lane a little bit and first ask you, how did you become uh, this big promoter in boxing? What led <laughs> you to the sport? Uh, what intrigued you about it? Uh, you know, Who were some of the people growing up that you looked up to in this sport? Give us a little rundown of the how you got started and became what uh, you are now. I um, I fell in love with boxing uh, when I was 12 years old. That was in 1959. Started watching the Friday night fights on TV with my dad. A year later, as a birthday present, he took me to my first fight at Convention Hall in Philly, and we saw uh, going in that night the number one lightweight in the world, Len Matthews, the contender, got beat up pretty bad by Doug Valiant and uh, started a descent from which he never uh, climbed out of. And my boyhood hero was Harold Johnson, the light heavyweight champ from Philadelphia. And um, I went to school for journalism. I went to Temple, and I, uh, at the end of my junior year, I started working full-time for the uh, Evening Bulletin, which was the number one afternoon paper in Philly, and I... I wanted to be the boxing writer there, and the guy was uh, the boxing writer was uh, approaching retirement, and I was working the desk and editing and doing a few stories on the side. But uh, they kept giving him extensions on his re- his mandatory retirement, and uh, honestly, I didn't want to sit around and wait for the guy to die. So when you're working an after an evening paper, you have deadline is until 6 a.m. You know, the stories start coming in at midnight. You've got five or six hours to put the paper together, and there's a lot of free time. And I used to spend it in what they called the morgue, the bullet, the library, where they had every story, sports or otherwise, that ever appeared in the newspaper. And I started studying the boxing stories, seeing who was promoting, what nights of the week the fights were on, how many people came, what the gross was. And I I just studied and studied, and since I was working full-time while I was going to college, Temple University in Philly, I saved up enough money to, uh, when I graduated in 68, I had $5,000 in the bank, and uh, a year later I promoted my first fight at the Blue Horizon. I left the Bulletin a a month earlier, and I made uh, $1,500 on my first show. Benny Briscoe fought uh, Tito Marshall in a rematch. And I'd been making $7,500 a year at the Bulletin, and here I made 1500 the first night. But at the end of a year, I made the same 7500 and um, I was having a better time. Yeah, I, I, I bet. Now, uh, for anybody who wants to get into the game now as a promoter, would they be able to start the same way? Uh, I mean, uh, is there more roadblocks now, or can you get in the same way that you did uh, back then? The roadblocks are different now. The roadblocks back then was um, the old timers didn't like young kids getting in. There were still some aspects of the mob hanging around. People had connections. Today it's much tougher because it's much tougher to make a buck in boxing because it's not the sport it was back uh, 43, 42 years ago when I started. You could you could make a living promoting fights back then without television. But today, unless you can get on television, and even then it's not always uh, for sure because ESPN doesn't pay what they used to, and Showbox is a closed shop, and Showtime is a closed shop, and HBO is partly a closed shop. So it's tough to make a breakthrough and, and get you, you know, you have, to, you have to go partners with a promoter who's got ins at the networks, and it, it it uh, the cycle perpetuates itself and it keeps the ins in and the outs out. Yeah, and then you know that that seems to be uh, you know I've talked to other people too and they say that uh, about getting in now. But uh, let's talk about some of the boxers that you've had and uh, you, you mentioned Harold Johnson who was one, your guy and uh, you know I've seen some footage on him. A few fights are available out there, but from what I've seen, one of the best purest boxes you could e- ever see. Let's talk about him a little bit, because you've probably seen a lot more of him than I have. 
Well, I mean, Harold never fought for me, but um, I, uh, the second fight I ever went to was when he defended his championship. He had a piece of the title there, then against Von Clay at the arena in Philly. It was sold out in a very hot April night, 7,000 people, and he knocked Von Clay out in the second round, and uh, a year later he unified the title on national television also at the arena when he beat Doug Jones over 15 rounds. And less than a year later, Doug Jones nearly beat a young Cassius Clay in Madison Square Garden. And uh, the only other time I saw Harold fight in person was when he lost a close decision to Johnny Pearsall in Madison Square Garden. But I do remember the night they stole his title on television when he fought Willie Pastrano in Las Vegas. That was June of 63. And, I mean, they talk, <laughs> they talk about Pacquiao and Bradley. That was like kindergarten compared to the decision given in the Harold Johnson, uh, Willie Pastrano fight. It, it yeah. doesn't even rank with those kind of decisions. Right, right, and, and, and I, I saw some of the comments, and I was, uh, you know, screaming about that on the show from from the beginning, and we'll talk about that a little bit later on. Uh, but uh, you know, one of the one my favorite fighter of all time was a guy you have uh, worked with and uh, had fights in Philadelphia, and that's marvelous Marvin Hagler. Uh, you know, I'm dying to get the perspective of somebody who was in those arenas, as I assume you were, in all those great Philly fights he had with uh, Monroe and uh, Watts, and uh, just get your perspective on him for a minute. Well, Marvin fought for me five times, and he lost two of them. Um, the first fight with Watts was a bad decision. He won that fight because I remember when it was over, the, the, Spectre, the president of Spectrum, <laughs> he, came, he came down to me in the dressing room. He said, how can they do that? In other words, how can they give the decision to Monroe? I mean, to Watts. It was a majority decision, but Hagler won the fight. I mean, it wasn't outrageous, but he was a clear 6-4, 7-3 winner on rounds. Then two months later, he substituted for Vinnie Curdo, who I think we all knew was not going to show up to fight Monroe. And that fight, in my opinion, was the only time Marvin Hagler ever got beat up in a professional ring. Um, every round was close, but Hagler admitted afterward that Monroe had won the fight clearly, like 7-3, to 8-2. to two. The problem with that fight is we had a tremendous snowstorm that day, and the film crew couldn't get to the spectrum. So there's no video of his first fight with Monroe. And it's unfortunate for Monroe because it was the greatest night of his career. And then, um, But because it was such a good fight, we brought Marvin back in, September, and he fought Cyclone Hart, and he had it rough early. Then he knocked Hart down in the third round, and then he took control of the fight, and Hart refused to come out for the ninth round. He was arguing with his corner. They thought he should have done better, so he said, the heck with you, I'm not fighting anymore. And then uh, Marvin went back to uh, Boston. He fought Monroe again up there in a rematch, and he stopped him in the 12th round. And then we brought him back in 77 August for the rubber match with Monroe, and you've probably seen the highlights of that. That's the one where he knocked Monroe. So Monroe's head is out of the ring, but it's still on the apron, and Monroe gets up, and this is the second round, and he staggers all over the place, and they stop the fight. And then a year later, we brought Marvin back for the big one with Briscoe, which drew the largest indoor crowd in the history of Pennsylvania for a non-championship fight. And he beat Briscoe, I'd say, 7-3, to three, but he gave him all the respect in the world. He didn't stand in there. He didn't try to get him out of there. Marvin boxed and moved. And Briscoe was 35 at the time, and that was old. That was old for a fighter in those days. But uh, that, that Marvin, Marvin got better because you get better by fighting better fighters. And that's something that today's fighters and managers just don't want to hear about. All they want to do is be 25-0 and 0 or 30-0 and 0 and fight a bunch of bums and hope they get on HBO. And the only way they can succeed this way is because nine times out of ten, and I've said this many times, is that the guy in the other corner came up the same way. So you, you don't get a fighter like Hagler, a black left-hander from Boston, coming down to Philly and fighting the toughest black fighters he could find in their backyard and learning how to beat them. You don't get that today. That's why Hagler is a 
Hall of Famer, and these other guys are frauds. Right, right. But I'm and, getting uh, off the subject. Here. No, that's fine. Anytime you talk about Marvin Hagler, I'm all ears. But uh, as far as I know, there's no footage of the, the second Monroe fight either. At least, at least I have never seen I've it. I've just seen it. I've just seen it. Oh, uh, it be about I, I, a fellow from – I trade DVDs with a fellow from California, and he's got like the last three rounds of the Hagler-Monroe second fight. It's the first time I've ever seen it. Oh wow! I would le- definitely love to see that. That's a treat right there. But mm-hmm. uh, certainly, uh, you know, the the stories of the first Monroe fight are well mm-hmm. publicized with the you know the the blizzard and all of that. And uh, m- many people feel that that it was truly the only fight he ever lost. And uh, I've read that a bunch of times. And I'm glad to actually talk to somebody who was there for the yeah. Fight. Don't don't let anybody tell you that he got robbed in that fight. He won't even tell you that he lost that fight. Yeah, that's what I've read that plenty of, of times. And he comes on to be this great champion, and uh, you, you've had plenty of uh, great champions as well. And uh, one of my, one of my other favorite fighters uh, growing up was Matthew Saad Muhammad. Uh, can you talk about him a little bit? One of the most uh, exciting fighters, you know, to come along. I mean. Just made great TV fights, changed his style after losing a controversial fight to then Eddie Gregory, later Eddie Mustafa Muhammad in Philly, because he was mostly a boxer in those days, Matthew was. And after that fight, he said, you know, I can't leave this in the judges' hands. And his first fight with Marvin Johnson at the Spectrum in July of 77, when he knocked Marvin out in the 12th and last round for the NABF title, In my lifetime, that was the greatest fight I ever saw in person, and I was fortunate to have promoted it. It was just, you know, you know Rock'em Sock'em Robots, but this was Rock'em's. This was like, I watched it a couple years ago with Nigel Collins, the former editor of The Ring, and the first round we, we, we just started laughing because there was no, there was no feeling out, there was nothing. They just went at each other and just, just threw bombs for 12 rounds. It's amazing. It's amazing that they both uh, lasted that long. Just a, just a wonderful fight. And then he followed that up by getting off the floor to knock out Dynamite Douglas, Buster's father, in a terrific fight. And then I had him the first time with Yaki Lopez. I mean, every fight was just uh, Richie Cates had him on the floor. He got up and knocked out Cates. And, and just a, just a, an all action fighter, but it made for a short career because in in more modern times it's a lot of times what the fighters do outside of the ring than what they do inside of the ring that shortens their career it's not so much the tough fights that you put them in it's how they live when they're outside the ring and that's why guys today don't fight sixty seventy eighty ninety a hundred times anymore, but their yeah. careers are still short yeah, and by the time uh, he stepped in with Dwight Braxton, certainly not the same fighter, but Braxton uh, was another killer that you could uh, tell us about a little bit. Braxton um, Braxton was one of these guys that nobody paid attention to in the gym. And if they don't recognize the name, it's Dwight Muhammad Kawi. But, so he was like 4-1 and one or 5-1, and one and uh, we got a call for a fight in South Africa. And, and Braxton, you know, he couldn't get work, so we sent him to the South Africa, Africa to fight a fighter named Theonis Kok, K-O-K. And he was uh, a hot star down there. And Braxton went down there and knocked him flat. And everybody, who, everybody wanted to know who this guy was because at the same time there was an accomplished pro out of Detroit named David Braxton. And everybody thought we had sent down a ringer. But uh, then Braxton entered what was then the ESPN Light Heavyweight Tournament, and he blew through that knocked everybody out, and then we got him the big fight with uh, Mike Rossman on CBS in, uh, what was that, 1981, and he just brutalized Rossman, and uh, that put him on Broadway. And, yeah. uh The thing with the first fight between Braxton and Saad was that it was an afternoon fight, and in those days you wait in the morning of the fight, even though it was an afternoon fight, I think the weigh-in was something like 7 or 8 o'clock, and the fight went off at 4. It was in Atlantic City, and Saad Muhammad came to the weigh-in six pounds overweight, which is inexcusable, especially for a Philadelphia guy 
with a Philadelphia trainer, and he had to go out on the beach and run for hours to take off six pounds. They wouldn't even let you do that today with the 1% rule. You can only lose 1% of your body weight. So by the time that fight started, it's amazing that he made it 10 rounds with the beating he took and the dehydration. Yeah, and that uh, led up to a, a rematch. And uh, well, one of the fights that was always to discuss during that time was uh, Saad and uh, Michael Spinks. And it wound up being uh, Michael Spinks and uh, Dwight Braxton, Ma- Dwight Muhammad Kawi. And that was was a, a fight billed as a potential brawl. And it was a different type of a fight. Uh, many people have said it was boring, but it was a fight I like to watch a lot because I always find something interesting about it. But uh, Spinks did beat uh, Kawi in, in 15 rounds. Can you talk about that fight a little bit? Because it's a fight I'm, I was always very interested in. Spinks was a thoroughbred. He was one of the best light heavyweight champions of all time, but never got the credit because all people can remember is his one-round loss to uh, Mike Tyson. But Spinks, I mean, he destroyed Marvin Johnson. I think he beat Yaki Lopez. Um, he was just, a, he was a machine. He was a machine. He beat, and, 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 and until he won the title, he didn't have a quality trainer in his corner. Butch Lewis's half brother, uh, Nelson was his trainer. And I don't even know if you remember, but when he fought Eddie, I guess he was Eddie Mustafa Muhammad by then for the title, Eddie Futch was in the corner as the cut man because the fight was in Vegas. Right, right, right. And, and Gregory was, Mustafa Muhammad was winning the fight, the first six, seven rounds. And, and Spinks overheard Eddie Futch giving Nelson some, some hints, some advice. So Spinks turned to Eddie and said, you sound like you know what you're talking about. Why don't you get up here and take over? And then the fight suddenly changed. He dropped Mustafa Muhammad, and he won the second half of the fight and won the title, and Eddie Futch became his full-time trainer after that. But it's amazing that he got to that fight, to that point in his career, with nobody helping him. Wow, that's a great story. That's something I, I don't think I knew. I mean, I knew Futch was in the corner, but I didn't know uh, that uh, manifested that, that day, and that, that's a great story there. What about some of your per- personal favorite fights that you've, uh, you know, obviously promoted and and been at uh give us some of your uh, great uh, memories of the old days well beside the first johnson uh saad muhammad fight the first fight between benny briscoe and cyclone hard at the spectrum in uh november 75 british boxing news voted it the second best fight in the world that year behind the thriller in manila it was just you know two north philadelphia middleweights just standing toe to toe for 10 rounds and uh that was a great fight um a lot of highlights i mean the night jeff chandler won the title in uh miami beach when he knocked out uh julian solis and then the day he defended the title against his old high school um classmate johnny carter in philadelphia uh, carter had you know jeff only had two amateur fights he had a fight on a friday which he won and then three nights later, he lost to Carter. And Carter at the time was a hotshot national amateur champ. And Jeff figured that if if he's going to do that well with a national champ, what's the point in staying as an amateur? So he turned pro after two amateur fights, and now he's in the Hall of Fame. But years later, when Carter was a contender and Jeff had the title, Carter was from South. They were both from South Philly. They both went to Bach High School. They fought each other, and, and Jeff got his revenge and knocked him out on NBC. He was probably, for out-and-out talent, the best fighter I ever had. Another fighter that I had who had a tragic ending was Tyrone Everett. He His his 15-round 15, his 15 loss to Alfredo Escalera for the title at the Spectrum was another atrocious decision. I don't always agree with Harold Letterman, but Harold calls that the worst decision he's ever seen in his life. They actually, without getting sued, they actually, the Philadelphia, we had a judge from Philly, a judge from Puerto Rico, and a neutral referee from Mexico, and we spent a month 
doing a Dun and Bradstreet on the referee from Mexico to make sure that he was on the up and up because we knew the Puerto Rican judge was going to go for Escalera. And we figured the Philly judge would vote for Everett because Everett was going to kick his backside anyway. We never realized, you know, this was 1976, so I, was, I wasn't even 30 years old yet, and we were wet behind the ears. And some of the mob guys were still around, and uh, some people from Philly got in touch with some people who knew the the judge and they bought him off and he voted against uh, Everett and I remember going I remember when the fight was over I walked up to the ring and Ed Darian was reading the scorecards and the first scorecard he read was Lou Tress from Philadelphia votes 145 Escalera 143 Everett and I and I said to myself, Eddie, you just embarrassed yourself in front of 16,000 people by reading the scorecard backwards. <laughs> I mean, that's how incredible the fight was. It was like 10 or 11 to four. It wasn't even. And, and then you know, all of a sudden, I realized what was going on here. And uh, if it had been Everett, the thing with Everett was he wasn't that popular with a lot of the fans because he he was a little bit of a he put down other fighters. And he put down Briscoe in, in the uh, in the paper as being a stupid walk-in fighter. And Briscoe was like a love god in Philly. Everybody loved him. If that had been Briscoe who had gotten hosed that night at the Spectrum, they would have torn the building down. They would have burned it. But Everett didn't have that kind of loyal following, even though we had a monster crowd. He ran with a quicker crowd, and that got to him a year later when he was shot in the face by a jealous girlfriend over whatever it was but uh he was 36 and 1 and uh he was an outstanding fighter and when you think about the two fights in later years between Arguello and Escalera and how much trouble Escalera gave Arguello and the fact that Escalera couldn't hit Tyrone in the backside with a shotgun it just shows you how good Tyrone could have been all right and and thanks for that another great story now there are a lot of of uh, different, uh, you know, obviously different rules. The, the game is so much different today. And one, and you already touched on one of the biggest differences is with the scoring. The referee no longer scores uh, a, a fight anymore, and they, they used to all the time. Uh, do you prefer it that way, or did, did you think it was a good thing to have the referee scoring fights? No. Uh, no, I like it with three judges. The referee has enough to do. Uh, just like TV announcers have a lot to do. You know, they score the fights, but, you know, you're watching a fight and you're analyzing the fight and you're trying to keep score in your head, but that's a tough job, too, for announcers. So, you know, especially when you listen to HBO and, and sometimes they're so off in their scoring that it throws the, the casual fan off. And I think uh, that's part of the outcry on the Bradley Pacquiao fight. But no, I like three judges. I just like I'd like three honest judges or three competent judges. And if Pennsylvania or New York or New Jersey or Nevada only has three competent judges in the whole state, then they should work every fight. I don't believe in taking turns if people aren't competent. Who needs them? Uh, you know, the problem is a lot of them are politically appointed. For years, Dobby Shirley, who everybody knows, had no clue what he was looking at. He kept getting assignments. And there's guys walking around today that are keep getting assignments, even though they turn in bad scorecards. The ironic part in, in Nevada is Dwayne Ford, who's universally respected, voted for Bradley. So he voted for Bradley. Listen, I was at the fight. And I had it 7-5 Pacquiao, okay? I mean, but it, that's okay because you don't have to win 10-5. The Yankees don't have to beat the Red Sox 10-0. They can beat them 1-0. So, yes, Pacquiao was the winner, but for Harold Letterman or Dan Raphael to say it was 11-1, to 1, come on, watch the last four rounds of that fight and tell me how many of those last four rounds that Pacquiao won. He completely shut down after the eighth round, completely. Yeah, I agree. So, I agree with that, and I, and I agree. I had the same exact card, seven to five, but uh, I, I don't know that that definitely changed. Uh, but do, do you think? I mean, it seems to cal have calmed down a little bit. But do you think uh, the outcry of the, that scorecard will change anything uh, in terms of how fights are scored and how? I hope. I hope it can. Handle? I hope it only makes the commissions look closer at the judges 
and sit them down like Jersey did after the Laura Williams fight. I, I was really appalled to read today that Jose Suleiman is considering having push button computers at ringside where the judges will hit a button for a clear shot, a glancing shot. I mean, come on, stop it, please. We don't need this. Just get yeah. good judges. Get good judges. Yeah, they seem to want to like develop a crutch uh, for everything uh, in, in, instead of dealing with the real problem. But another thing that uh, the WBC and Suleiman is big on is the open scoring. What's your opinion on that? I hate it. I hate it Cause because it's simple. You go into the four-corner offense and, and the, at the end of the fight, if you know the only way you can lose the fight is by knockout. So right. I don't like that at all. I think that's part of the intrigue of the business. I just think that there's – I don't think scoring fights is that hard to do. I think some judges look too hard. You're watching two guys fight. When the fight's over, you know who beat the other guy up. Come on. Don't don't look for things that aren't there. I mean, uh, defense. Forget defense. You know, it's who hits the other guy more. And here's a question for you. Two, one fighter throws 100 punches, okay? The other fighter doesn't throw any. Let's say round one. Fighter A throws 100 punches. Fighter B doesn't get hit with any of them. He blocks them. He ducks on Who wins the round? Oh, fighter A, I would say. Right, because he tried. Right. He at least tried. So, you know, um, I don't get it. I, I don't understand why... I understand, and I don't buy the thing where, well, you're sitting on that side of the ring, the judge sitting on the other side of the ring has a different view. Please stop it. Well, <laughs> you know, yeah, you can see. I mean, I agree with everything you're saying, and uh, I, I also uh, had Harold Letterman on here, and he wasn't as uh, agreeable with me on, on some of these things, although he hates open scoring. Uh, uh, the other thing that I find to be just as off as a lot of these judges' scorecards is the CompuBox. Uh, what's your opinion on CompuBox? I mean, I know it's a good tool to have, but it just doesn't seem like they get it right a lot. I Listen, I love Bob Canovio, who runs CompuBox, but what what makes... I mean, a power punch is anything but a jab. Well, you know, you can throw a lazy hook that just touches the guy as opposed to a devastating hook, you know, that that hurts somebody even though both punches land. So they're both counted as power punches, but they don't have the same effect on the guy. And, and I don't know for a fact, if I throw a left hook and a guy blocks it with his bicep, does that count? I never asked Bob. Does that count as a punch landed? A punch is blocked by the arms. Do they count as punch landed? Does, does anybody know? I, yeah, I I've never asked Bob. These are questions that are always asked about uh, CompuBox, but... Uh, you know, the, the guys who work CompuBox the night of the fight are never really announced. We never know who they are or what they're looking at. And it, But HBO seems to, like, shove CompuBox down your throat, and that's the point I was trying to make to Mr. Letterman, and he scolded me on it. <laughs> I felt like a little kid. Well, I, I, have, I have the heavyweight Brian Jennings. He's my fighter. And we fought Steve Collins last week on uh, NBC. Now, at the end of the night, they said that Steve Collins landed 67 punches. I didn't see him. I didn't see Steve Collins hit Brian Jennings with 67 punches in that fight, unless you're counting punches that are blocked by the elbow and, or, the, or the bicep or, or whatever. I didn't see him land 67 punches. So I don't, I don't know what the, their criteria is. I, I think boxing is very easy to score. People are making too much out of it. You go down the street, you see two guys fighting on the street corner, you know who's winning the fight. You know who's beating the other guy up. It's not that hard, but they're making it hard. Yeah, exactly. And I was covering that fight, uh, I saw, and I've had Brian Jennings on the show uh, a couple of times already, and I, I really like what I see. And you obviously liked what you saw in him. What uh, led you to signing him? What did you like about him? Obviously, he's on the right path. Can you talk about him for a little bit? He's managed and trained by a very close friend of mine, Fred Jenkins, who actually fought for me. I think Fred had three professional fights around 73 and 74, but in later years he had the IBF lightweight champion Charlie Choo Choo Brown 
and later than that he had rock and rodney moore and he he came to me a couple years ago and he said he's got the next heavyweight champion of the world i said okay fred good and uh I didn't sign him at first. He had some fights, and uh, I guess after his fourth or fifth fight, we got together and signed him. And uh, he was doing okay. He wasn't um, he wasn't knocking knocking people through doors. Nobody was getting excited. He was a good looking heavyweight that that never even had a boxing glove on until Christmas of '09. I mean, you know, think about that. Or or was yeah around around the December of '09 he had like third what did he have somewhere between 13 and 17 amateur fights he played basketball he was all state defensive end in high school at uh, I think Ben Franklin High in North Philly and he tried everything basketball shot put track uh, football and he decided to try boxing and uh, he's a natural athlete he's got a good head on his shoulders. He had dreams of being an architect. He's done some blueprints. He's got a full-time job as a mechanic at the Federal Reserve Bank. And uh, he likes to keep things simple. He he doesn't want a big entourage. He's loyal to the kids in the gym. Uh, After the fight, uh, we were joking the other night. I said, listen, we're the corner drugstore. We're not CVS or Rite Aid. We're going to do it our way. (laughs) That's that's, a good one. uh, that's how. That's the way he thinks. He he's got money and some of his money now invested in real estate. But come January, this past January, when uh, Eddie Chambers pulled out of the Lyakovich fight, like on what was it, ten days' notice, Fred called me up and said, "What about Brian?" I said, "Are you crazy?" He said, "Put us in." So when I called main events, they said, "Okay," and then Lyakovich pulled out. And then we went through a few f- possible opponents, one of whom actually was Steve Collins. There was Justin Jones from Texas. There was Jason Gavern. And then they offered me uh, Maurice Byram. And I said to myself, there's no way Fred's going to fight an undefeated left-hander who's got some ability. And Fred said, just make the money right and we'll be there. And nobody picked Jennings to win. Nobody. Because Byram is originally from Philly. His father fought for me. And Bryant went out there and found a way to win the fight by out. He willed himself to win the fight, in my opinion. And then uh, he made a big hit. And then uh, he was in the office maybe two, three weeks later. And I said, "What about Lyakovich?" He said, "No." Nah. He said, "I need a break. Uh, you know, let's take a step backward. It's coming too fast." So I said, "Okay, but I want just think about this." I think if I if Byarm takes the fight because he didn't embarrass himself that night, Byarm. If Byarm takes the fight and beats Lyakovich, you'll be kicking yourself in the backside. So he said that's okay, but I could see he was thinking. So he got up and walked out of the office. This was on a Sunday, and Fred said to me, he "said Give me some time." And uh, Fred called back a few hours later and says, "We'll take the fight." And when I was joking with Brian about this about a week or two ago. I said, what was going on that day? He said, when you told me that I'd be kicking myself in the backside if Byarm took the fight, that got to me. And that's when I, even though I didn't say anything to you, Russell, at the time, that's when I decided I was taking the fight. And look, uh, you know, he was a tremendous win. But people get carried away. You know, things are never as good as they seem, I tell them, and things are never as bad as they seem. After he beat Lyakovich, he's the greatest American heavyweight we've got. After the Collins fight, a couple people jumped off the bandwagon. I said, listen, six months ago, fighting Collins would have been a tremendous step up for you. So some guys you can't knock out. You just can't knock everybody out. So, But he he's an athlete. He does a lot of things that today's lumbering, lug, light, uh, lumbering heavyweights can't do. He can move. He's got speed. He's athletic. I mean, look at these guys from Europe. They're they're like uh, who was the guy in Rocky? You know, they're like big Frankenstein monsters. Brian <laughs> Brian Brian can move. He I'm not saying he could beat Klitschko because at this point he can't. But the style, the way he fights, in and out, side to side, with speed and fast hands, a guy like that will beat Klitschko. Right, right, and but give him some time. Be around. Right. So we're gonna go to this. Ready. We're going to go to the phones for a second. Caller from the 815 area. Cody, you have a question for J. Russell Peltz? Yeah, hi, Zoot. This is Dave Murphy. How you doing, uh, Dave? Oh, pretty good. Uh, 
was always wondered, uh, I've always kind of felt that Benny Briscoe would have beat uh, Bernard Hopkins. And I was wondering, uh, you know, I know Russell is a big uh, Benny Briscoe fan. And I was wondering if he, he agrees with that or, you know, what his thoughts would be on that matchup. I'm very prejudiced. And um, my favorite <laughs> comment is that Benny Briscoe would tear Bernard Hopkins a new backside in so many words. It's not that. It's just that. Bernard Hopkins is a first ballot surefire Hall of Famer. There's no doubt about that by what he's accomplished. But if you're asking me, could the best Bernard Hopkins beat the best Benny Briscoe, or could the best Bernard Hopkins beat the best George Benton, I don't know. It was such a different – in other words, if Bernard Hopkins had fought the same guys that Benny Briscoe fought, and Benny Briscoe didn't miss anybody – he wouldn't be whatever he is, 56 and 4, whatever his record is. You know, I talked, my kids used to ask me, well, what was Benny Briscoe's record, Dad, if he was so good? I said, well, it was 66 wins, 24 losses, and 6 draws, so they broke up laughing. They said, <laughs> well, that's his. They said, that's pathetic. I, but you don't understand when you're fighting Emil Griffith twice and Rodrigo Valdez three times and Louis Rodriguez twice and Monzone twice and Vicente Rondon and all the tough black fighters like Cyclone Hart and Jimmy Lester and Eddie Gregory and, and just one at Joe Shaw. I mean, it, it was just a different business. It was a different sport back then, but... You know, Benny would hit Hopkins in the, in, the, in the kidneys, in the spine, in the cup. You know, it'd be a rough fight for Hopkins. It, it's Naturally, I think Briscoe would have drilled him, but people tell me I'm crazy. So it was a – listen, Rodrigo Valdez, one of the most underrated fighters of my generation. I mean, he was three for three against Briscoe, and he was the only man in 96 fights to stop Briscoe with a desperation shot. Nobody even talks about Rodrigo Valdez. He, he, nobody even thinks about him. I mean, these guys, I mean, Louis Rodriguez, who in my opinion beat Griffith three out of four but only got the decision once, one of the greatest fighters who ever lived, but nobody talks about him because he didn't hold the title that long. People who are into boxing today, and I hate to sound like this, they don't have any frame of reference because guys like Burt Sugar and... And they're gone. They're gone. All you see is grainy old black and white fights, films, and nobody even wants to watch them. I mean, I would show old black and whites to fighters. I don't want to watch this. I want to watch, you know, fights in color with sound and noise. So you can't really get a perspective of how good these guys were. Benny Briscoe would have been a handful for any middleweight who ever lived. I'm not saying he would have beat them, but it wouldn't have been a walk in the park. I mean, Valdez went to the hospital after all three fights, and Briscoe went out and partied. So um, just a different time. I mean, George Benton was such a good fighter that I think he lost fights because he was having such a good time hanging in the pocket like Whitaker used to do. He taught Whitaker that, that he lost track of whether or not he was actually winning fights. He, there was no way he should lose to Hurricane Carter. No, Hurricane Carter was a modern-age, crude brawler. He couldn't hit George Benton in the backside, but Benton figured he's fighting in the garden for the first time in the main event. I'm going to knock the guy out. And he, and, he, and he forgot that he was George Benton, the classic artist. So those guys, I mean, George Benton actually fought for me twice. And, uh, you know, I'm proud to say that uh, these guys, they knew how to fight. They, these guys, you just don't have fighters around. I mean, what was his record, 69 and 13? How can you compare? Let's say George Benton's ranked number five in the world. He's 69 and 13. Now, who's ranked number five? You're going to match him up with Peter Quillen, for God's sake? Come on. It's, it's I'm sounding yeah. like these old timers when I first started, but it's no, the no, truth. You're, you're making a lot of sense, and yeah, I agree with a lot of this. I talk about Rodrigo Valdez a lot, and people are like who? And right. I, and I would certainly watch those old grainy fights. Uh, send them my way, Russell. Uh, you won't, <laughs> they, they, they won't be wasted. But uh, you know, but but you know, the game is still exciting. We have to you know promote the game today somewhat. Who do you think are the best fighters that are out there now? And are there any fighters that could have? You know, hung in that era. I don't think there were many that could hang in that era, but I still think there are a lot of great 
talented fighters out there. Who are some of your favorites today? Floyd Mayweather is by far the best fighter of his generation. Whether you like him or not, whether you can get past his personality and what he does on the street and the fact that he's doing time for a disgusting act, the only thing that bothers me about Floyd Mayweather is his, in my opinion, the fact that he's not going to fight Pacquiao. Uh, the 60-40 thing just doesn't cut it with me. It's, you don't want to fight the guy for 50-50. You don't want to fight him. That's all. And the fact that he was a little picky and choosy, but I think Floyd Mayweather would have survived in any era. He's a terrific, terrific fighter. And I don't like to rate fighters until their careers are over because if we had rated Mike Tyson the night he knocked out Michael Spinks, he would have been one of the five greatest heavyweights who ever lived. Now is he even in the top 10 or 15? But Mayweather doesn't have that much longer, so he would have been a handful for any fighter in any era. I'm not, I've never been sold on Pacquiao. Um, I, I don't know. I've just never been sold on him. Um, Whitaker was a, an outstanding fighter, Pernell Whitaker, just a terrific fighter. Um, I don't know. Throw some names at me. I'm, I'm in brain freeze right now. I, uh, Hopkins. For a guy who who was not fun to watch, he knew how to win. He was uh, a modern-day Monzone, but Monzone was actually more entertaining than Hopkins. And plus, Monzone fought on the road. You know, he, those guys fought all over the world. I mean, that that to me, there's nothing better, there's nothing more satisfying than going overseas and winning. That's the best. I mean, when Malinaji went to wherever he went to to beat that Ukrainian welterweight champ, or years ago when Danny Lopez went to Ghana and beat David Kotai in front of 80,000 Africans, there's no better feeling than that. What was your impression? In the what was your impression of Roy Jones Jr.? Very disappointed because he wouldn't. Uh, uh, he's a talent, but you get better. I mean, some of the title fights that he fought would have been non-title fights in Archie Moore's day. You know, how can you put him on TV? Like, you know, the guy, they said, oh, he's so great. He knocked him out with his hands behind the back. Who was that, Kelly? I mean, do right, you think right. he would have had his hands behind his back if he were fighting Harold Johnson or Saad Muhammad? I mean, he was a terrific talent. He really was, but he wasted his career by fighting, and HBO enabled him by letting him fight all those terrible guys. Right, right. Terrible. Now, there's a big fight coming up in September, two middleweights, Julio Cesar Chavez Jr., Sergio Martinez. Can you give us your uh, opinions on those fighters? It should be made. The fight should be made. There's no doubt, but, I mean, don't tell me that Sergio Martinez is the next Monzone because the night Pavlik knocked out Jermaine Taylor, Bob Arum called him the next Monzone because he beat the guy that Emmanuel Taylor said was, Emmanuel Stewart said was the next Hagler. There's so, can you imagine if Wilt Chamberlain and Bill Russell were playing today with ESPN? We'd be worshiping them. The hype that goes on today, a guy wins one fight, and all of a sudden they start comparing him to guys who had hundreds of fights, Archie Moore, I mean, Joe Lewis, I, come on, you know, the pressure you put on fighters and the hype that they get is, is, doesn't justify, isn't justified. But Martinez and Chavez is a fight that has to be made, just like Donaire and Rigando. Let's make those fights. This is what boxing needs. You've got to make the fights. I love Bob Arum. I, I think he's the greatest promoter of his generation, and it sickens me to, to see the slurs that he gets hit with on the internet, but Bob will, I love Bob, he'll never spend the money, he'll never spend, he'll never make a dent in the money he's made, so why doesn't he make those fights? Let the Nair fight Rigando. You know, let's make the fights that have to be made. I don't blame him for Pacquiao. I think people are wrong on that. I think that's Mayweather's fault. I'm on the Pacquiao side there. If there's something I don't know, 
someone would have to show me. But Donaire should fight Rigondeau. Martina should fight Chavez. Boxing needs those kind of fights so we don't have to listen to all the negative stuff people are saying about boxing. I'm not crazy about Chad Dawson and Frock. I'm sorry, Ward, because the style, Chad Dawson is is sleep-inducing. You know, right, Teddy, right. <laughs> Teddy Brenner, who's the greatest matchmaker who ever lived, said anybody can make number one against number two. All you got to do is, is, is pay the money. Is the matchmaker is the guy that can make the fight that, that style-wise people want to see, and nobody wants to see Chad Dawson because if Chad Dawson or a lot of these guys who fight on HBO, if they had to depend on selling tickets, they'd starve to death. Right. They make nothing. They're not. They're, fighters today are so overpaid because nobody, you know, because HBO overpays them. Showtime overpays them. Let them draw gates. Let let the let people come and pay good money to see them, and then we'll see how popular they are. And Chavez brings people. He brings people. Martinez doesn't, but Martinez is getting better at the gate, and that fight should be made. That's all. Should be made. And uh, you have a, a card coming up on uh, July the seventh. You want to talk about that for a little bit? Yeah, it, it's a uh, it's a middle class. I mean, it, it's in boxing's middle class. I got two two kids. Patrick Majewski, a Polish fighter. I guess he's about eighteen and one. I don't have the records in front of me. Against Chris Fitzpatrick from uh, now living in Albany, also about eighteen and one. Two walk in aggressive, limited middleweights that's going to make for a very entertaining fight in Atlantic City where Majewski comes from. Uh, a lot of people had high hopes for Majewski. He got stopped a couple fights ago by a kid named Tories out of Columbia. I just watched it last night. And Fitzpatrick's only loss was to Jose Stinger Medina, pretty tough kid out of uh, Rhode Island. So it's a good fight, fans fight. And we'll probably draw 12, 1,300 people at Bally's on July 7th. But the middle class of boxing is suffering, and uh, you need more competitive fights at that level instead of everybody promoting cowboy against Indian cards in which the blue corner wins every fight and the promoters' fighters win every fight and everything is geared toward HBO and Showtime. And in the meantime, why, are people, why would people spend 50 or $75 to see one-sided club fights when they're complaining about spending 8 and not $10 to go to the movies? You're asking them to spend 50 and 75 to see a match. You better give them entertainment value. And we're right. not getting enough of that. Now, what do you think could happen or what does have to happen for this kind of stuff to change? Uh, is there any hope for it to change? We have, well, the first thing we have to do is make a sweeping change at all the networks and the people that are in position to buy fights because they don't have a clue. And I can say that because they're not going to hurt me because they don't buy my fights anyway. Okay? I've been blackballed at ESPN for years. Showtime is a closed shop. They hired Golden Boy's attorney. I mean, come on, give me a break. And HBO had a chance. There were so many possibilities at HBO, and I think, and I don't think, I think they missed the ball. The best thing HBO did in the last year was hire Peter Nelson as a um, the young man who wrote the Freddie Roach book. I've been with Peter. He is brilliant, beyond brilliant. And he knows boxing, and hopefully he will move into a more um, powerful position at HBO. But see, when we had to depend on our living by selling tickets, we had to convince 10,000 people that we were putting on a good show because they were buying tickets and they were spending their money. So the promoter, whether he had the fighter or not, he made his living by promoting the fights that people wanted to see. Today, you have to have a relationship at ESPN or Showtime or HBO, and you have to convince one person there that you have a good fight, and he'll buy it. I had Mike Jones. Now, let's forget what Mike Jones has become because he's not the fighter he was a couple years ago when I was touting him. He was an aggressive, all-out banger if you look at his record, and then sometime in 2009 things changed. But I couldn't make a move with Mike Jones, so I had to go partners with Top Rank in order to get him on pay-per-view and HBO because I couldn't make a breakthrough. And 
I did that because Mike was getting up in years, and it was the right thing to do for him. It was the right thing to do. I had no choice. But promoters shouldn't be forced into that situation. Guys at the network should know who Mike Jones is. They should have known who Gabriel Rosado is. They should know Ronald Cruz, and not just my fighters. Any, there's a lot of good fighters out there that don't get on television. You see the best fights that HBO wants you to see. That doesn't necessarily mean they're the best fights. They're the fights HBO thinks is the best, and we all know that they're not the best, or Showtime. I, could, you know, I had one fight on Showbox in my life. And because Lou DiBella was my partner, I, you know, it's a closed shop. Only certain prov- – look at the promoters who fight after fight get on there. It's very tough for an independent promoter to make a breakthrough, so they have to turn their fighters over to other promoters after they've done all the work. My early years in boxing, I'll never forget it. The first year, guys came up to me, and they gave me a line I never forgot. They said, make sure if you crush the grapes – you drink the wine. Hmm. But That's a good one. <laughs> it's, not, it's not always like that. It's not always like that. That's the way the business is. When Ferdy Pacheco took over NBC in 1980, up until then, if your name wasn't Aram or King, you couldn't get on TV. Ferdy broke that stranglehold by giving me dates, Dan Duva dates, and Murad Muhammad dates. He broke the stranglehold, and then the other networks came along because the guy who, guys who bought fights in those days, Alex Wallow and Bob Iger at ABC, Mort Charnick and Gil Clancy at CBS, and Ferdy at NBC, they, they loved the boxing. They, they didn't care who you were. If you had a fighter they wanted to show on TV, like I had Curtis Parker and Frank the Animal Fletcher, my name didn't have to be Bob Arum. They gave us a break. But it's not like that today. There's too many, there's so too many subplots going on. Just to, and it's hurting the business. Now you you are getting your fighters on the NBC Sports Network. Cruz and, and Rosado were uh, on a, a card a couple of about a month ago or so, and it was a wonderful action-packed card. Stuff that you're talking about now. Uh, talk about a little bit how you got the breakthrough with the NBC Sports Network and main events. Well, I've been the advisor matchmaker at at main events since 2007. But Kathy Duva had been working that deal probably for five years. She was hammering NBC for five. I never believed she could do it because it it sounded like pie in the sky. And then it finally, she made the breakthrough. And the the good thing about the series with NBC is they don't have to approve our fights. In other words, they might say, like, Jennings made a hit in January, so try and use Jennings again. Or or Rosado made such a hit with Soto Carras, they gave us the extra show June 1st just so Rosado wouldn't go to ESPN or Univision. They wanted him on their network. So, But I don't have to call them up and say, is it okay to make Rosado and secure Pal? They trust us to make the right fights. Now, a lot of people are saying we're keeping it in-house. So what we've done since January is that we've kept a, a catalog of all the offers on emails that we have sent to other promoters and all their rejections. Like we were supposed to open the series in Florida with Rosado against Arisande Lara. And, oh, Louis de yeah, no problem. Well, when it came time to sign in contracts, they did, Golden Boy said forget about it. So we made Rosado with Soto Carras. We lost the deal in Florida. We came to Philly. And uh, when Chambers pulled out and we were stuck with Lyakovich and Jennings and then Jennings and Byram, I said to Kathy, let's make Rosado and Soto Carras the main event. And she said, you've got to think outside the box on this one. And those were her exact words. She said, we'll get more press out of putting two young heavyweights together, which you never see in a main event at this period in their careers. And she was right. She called it perfect. You know, Soto Carras and Rosado opened the show. It was a sensational fight. And then Jennings and Byarm was an action-packed fight between two aspiring heavyweights. And we took off from there with the Zab Judah fight in, in New York, a terrific win for him over Vernon Paris. And then Jennings blows everybody away by uh, beating Lyakovich and, and Adamix on the show. And then we had, you know, to the terrific win by Rosado in, uh, in, in um, Bethlehem before a 
standing room only crowd in Bethlehem, Pennsylvania, where Ronald Cruz is like Elvis Presley. Right. I mean, you, we, I, we could have sold twice as many tickets up there in a brand new state of the art arena. And I, and on top of that, I had Cruz in with the worst possible style. You know, when just before the first bell, I said, I don't know why I did this. Why would I put him in with a tall, lanky mover? And but he got through it. He got through it. But if if Cruz fights guys like Soto Carras or guys who come to him, you're going to see a, a much better action fight. And then we came back. I mean, we caught a bad break with Adam McChambers because of Chambers hurting his arm. But I understand they told me the ratings were terrific, and I'm shocked at that because we were going up against HBO that night with uh, Chavez and Andy Lee, and we still got a very good rating, and the network loved it. Well, yeah, that's, well that was my next question. Uh, the action has been great. How have the ratings been on, on these uh, NBC Sports networks? Because they've been terrific to watch. I, I just want to know if people know they're out there. That's a, you know, not a very prominent network. Are the ratings uh, what you were hoping for? It's never been less than the, the fight. The fight has never been less than the third highest rated show of the month on NBC Sports Network. So, that, I mean, that just goes to show you that if boxing was on more of these networks, and except for the premium networks, people would watch it. The days of, uh, you know, when we saw all these great fights on Saturday, Sunday afternoon, I think they would still do very well if they existed. But instead they have golf and uh, horse racing on. Well, but you got to give them good fights. And I told Kathy, I really didn't. When, when Joel Julio fell out, of the Rosado fight, I really didn't want to fight Sakyu Pal. I, not that Rosado couldn't beat him, but I, you know, it was a difficult fight, a left-hander. But I did it for the good of the series. And Gabby's easy because he would have fought Sakyu Pal in Brooklyn. I mean, he would fight a Frenchman in Paris. He'll fight anybody. He's a real throwback fighter. So it was not even a question of convincing him. I was the one, but I knew the series needed a name to for right, Gabby right. to fight. So we went through with it, and Gabby came through with a terrific win. See, some fighters think, what am I going to do if I lose? Gabby thinks, what's going to happen to me if I win? And by beating right. Sakyu Pal, he jumped all the way to number three in the IBF, and he's nine in the WBC. And by winning that WBO Intercontinental title, he should pop up in the WBO World Ranking. You know what would be a great fight if I were at HBO? James Kirkland and Rosado. I wouldn't even think twice. Yeah, that's a good one. I mean, you got two bulls. That's what, see, Kirkland and Angulo, we all knew it was going to be a great fight. So when it was over, why didn't they say, hey, a light goes off. These are the kind of fights we want to make. I would make Rosado and Kirkland in a heartbeat. I mean, I don't want to, nothing against Quintana or Molina or Austin Trout, for God's sake. People don't want to see that. People want to see heads roll. I, you know, you, you can sugar – I love Pernell Whitaker. He was a great fighter. I don't want to see eight Pernell Whitaker fights on one show. Right, I want right. to see Mike Tyson. When I, when I look for a fighter and I haven't seen him, especially in the days before YouTube, my first question always was, does he fight like Joe Frazier or does he fight like Michael Nunn? If he fights like Michael <laughs> Nunn, I don't want to hear about it. Right. Because if I don't want to see it, I can't sell it. I want fighters who fight like Joe Frazier. That's what people want to see. You know, the manly art, it's a great line, but people, people want to see people getting carried out. I'm sorry. That's the business we're in, and yes. uh, that's the way it is. Well, uh, extremely honest and candid uh, from you, uh, Mr. Pelton. I really appreciate it. I just want to throw out a, a couple of more fantasy matchups, uh, some that you might not have as personal ties with as Briscoe. Uh, but uh, who wins between uh, Marvin Hagler and Carlos Monzon, in your opinion? <laughs> uh, I've, I've picked Monzon in the past, and uh, and Marvin's probably never heard that because we're still pretty friendly. But uh, these are tough fights to pick. But those guys were basically from the same era. Monzon won. Monzon knew how to win. It's a tough call. I, if I had to lean anywhere. I'd lean with Monzone, maybe because I've seen Hagler vulnerable at times in his career. And uh, Monzone, he did such a good job with Briscoe in the rematch in Argentina. I was there. Hard to believe I was 25 years old. But Briscoe had him out. He had him out cold on his feet in the ninth round and couldn't, 
and just uh, missed his opportunity. But you know what? We would have the best we would, if he'd knocked Monzone dead there in Buenos Aires. The best we would have gotten was a draw anyway. But uh, those are two great fighters. I know a lot of people rag on Monzone. They look at the films and they just. But when you look at the guys he fought and where he fought them, he didn't. Uh, but he wanted to make sure he fought Briscoe in Argentina. He wasn't going to fight Briscoe in Europe. But I'd, I'd give a slight edge to Monzone, but it's not easy. Right, and my, my, as much as I love Marvin, he's the one guy I think that would have gave him a hell of a time. Uh, mm-hmm. how, about, how about Muhammad Ali and uh, Joe Lewis? You don't strike me as a big Muhammad Ali guy. I'm, I'm just guessing. Um, I'm swayed by the old timers who used to tell me that Joe Lewis would drill him. So a lot of people, then people come up to me, even people I really respect, like Bruce Trampler at top rank, and he says, did you ever look at those guys? Joe Lewis fought all those terrible white guys, you know. But it, it was it was a different time. It, it's tough to take... It's tough to take a fighter out of an era like people say Klitschko. I mean, come on, Klitschko. If Klitschko or Lennox Lewis were living in 1910, they would have been the size of Jack Johnson. And Jack Johnson walks down the aisle in Reno, and I don't think I can get in trouble for saying this on the air, in front of 15,000 racists, and they play a song called and this is a true song title, All Coons Look Alike to Me. That's the song that was played in Reno when Jack Johnson came out of the dressing room and also in the town all week long. Now, if you take Mike Tyson out of the 80s and you take him back to Reno, how is he going to handle that? So to take a fighter from one era, I think John, John L. Sullivan was one of the ten greatest heavyweight champions of all time because of what he accomplished. But if you've seen the photos of how guys used to fight in those days with their asses sticking out and their fists upside down, but if, if Klitschko were fighting in the 1890s, he'd have fought the same way because that's what people knew, and that was the food they ate, and that was the way they trained, and they chopped down trees. They didn't have all this, these power drinks and protein shakes and, 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 and strength coaches and things like that. So to compare fighters from eras that are so far apart isn't fair, certainly not in the heavyweights, but even in the other weight classes with what we know today about conditioning that we didn't know back then. But Ike Williams, who was washed up at 28 after 120 fights, he'd run these guys out of the ring today. He'd run them out of the ring. Uh, you know, yeah. just my opinion. Well, let's talk about something uh, that is closer to realistic. Uh, in your career as bo- you know, as a promoter, as a fan, as an observer, uh, can you give us one or two uh, fights that, that never materialized that could have that you really wanted to see? I know it's a tough question. It's probably a million, but do, do one or two stick out for you? Jeff Chandler against Lupe Pintor to unify the Bantamweight title. We could never make it. I didn't push hard enough. They didn't want it. Or, or Chandler against Carlos Zarate, uh, who was just slightly before Jeff, but was still around uh, at the time. Um, I think Jeff would have won, but, you know, all the Hispanic fans think Pintor or Zarate would have won. Um, it would have been nice to have seen Saad Muhammad uh unify the title with Michael Spinks or uh, a rematch with Mustafa Muhammad, which they were supposed to do on that uh, This Is It show that Muhammad Ali Professional Sports was promoting in the garden before they went out of business. Um, I don't know. When I had Charles Brewer, they were, I guess where there were, there were some bigger fights when he was the super bantamweight champ before he got hosed in Germany against Sven Otke. Uh I would have liked to have seen him fight some of the uh, outstanding super middleweights of the day. I don't know. I, I can't think unless you have some fights that you can mention to me. Well, what um, about? I mean, what about fights that you were that fighters that you did not have? Like, uh, like were you really clamoring to see Lennox Lewis and Riddick Bowe? I mean, uh, they fought a, as Olympics. That was a fight that could have happened, and didn't a lot of people refer to that as one of the fights that should have gotten made? Uh, what, what's your opinion on all of any, any unification fight should be made. Any, I'm not a big Lennox Lewis fan, um, uh, 
but uh, all the unification fights should have been made. Now, why is it so hard? I, I think that's that boxing's happened? biggest problem. Yeah, well, why is it so hard? I mean, now you have so many belts. But back then, even when there was just WBA and BC as the prominent titles, it was hard. How come? Well, let's put it this way. For example, we tried to make Jeff Chandler and Albert Davila after Davila won the title. I think he might have beaten Pintor for it. And uh, Jeff, Jeff somebody I, who uh, promoted Tyson's early fights, a fellow named Jeff from upstate New York, he was getting Davila on CBS or ABC, and I was getting Chandler on CBS or NBC or ABC. And he said to me, we're each making good money. The fighters are making good money. There's a limit to what we can get from the networks, so what's the point in fighting each other? And it was tough to argue with them because they weren't big enough for their own pay-per-view show. Uh, so fight never got made. I mean, Jeff would have fought it. Jeff would have fought those guys in California. I mean, he won the title from a Puerto Rican in Miami. He defended twice in Tokyo. Jeff wasn't afraid to to fight anybody. I went to Jeff one day when we were, when he was like 18 and 0, 19 and 0. I said we're going to fight Jose Resendez next month at the Spectrum, and Resendez was like from. Jeff was just on the verge of getting ranked. He had a record of like 18 and 15, and he said, "Can't you get me anybody better than that?" And and that that's the way Jeff was. We, we had to fight Miguel Iriarte once for a, in a. He was the number one contender from Panama. He wouldn't have beaten six-round kids in Philly, but we had to fight him because the Panamanians ran the WBA and Jeff had the title, and they, they moved the six-round fighter into the number one slot, and we watched the tape, and we started laughing. So we went down to resorts to defend the title, and the night before the fight, Jeff said, you know what, we better take another look at this guy in case there's something we missed. So we, we put the tape in again the night before the fight, and we watched it, and Jeff just shook his head and said, you know, Jeff was embarrassed by those kind of fights, and he went out there and he just toyed with the guy, and he prolonged the fight for nine rounds before he drilled him. But those are the kind of fights used to embarrass Jeff. But today, fighters want that. It's all about the business today. It's all about the money. It's not about the sport. You know, you call a guy up for a fight, and the fighter himself, forget the manager, the fighter says, let me check him out on box rec. I mean, I can imagine Benny Briscoe coming to me and saying, let me check him out on box rec. Are you kidding me? There was no <laughs> film in those days. There was no records. You had to go through the agate results in Ring Magazine to to try and piece fighters' records together. There was no fight facts. I mean, let me look him up on box rec, please. Wow. It's and, a uh, shame. Dave Murphy's still on hold. I imagine he has a couple of more questions <laughs> for you. Dave? Yeah, I was wondering uh, if, with today's boxing fans seemingly not being as, uh, oh, I don't know how I'd phrase it, not as technically up on what to look for in a fighter, would a Gypsy Joe Harris even be getting on TV today? I think you kind of addressed that earlier. But uh, is there less sophisticated fans, and you have to uh, you have to uh, matchmake to them? No, I think Gypsy would get on TV because he was a, a showman. He drew big crowds. Um, he had talent, even though if you check his record, there were only mm, maybe, well, uh, you know, it's hard to say quality because he fought Kitten Hayward, he fought Miguel Barreto, he fought Curtis Cox, he eventually fought Griffith, uh, Bobby Cassidy. You know, back then, it's funny, when I think of this now, back then, these were – Tough guys, but they were okay. But today, when I think of Bobby Cassidy and Miguel Barreto and Dickie De Veronica and, and Johnny Knight and some of the other guys that Gypsy beat on the way up, Jose Stable, I said, wait a second, these guys would have a picnic today. But see, the other thing that – and he was a big drawing card, and he had a unique style. See, I don't like it – when I when I was at ESPN before I got like pushed aside after six months and lost control of the programming in '98 and '99, I insisted that the promoters put the fights in places where people would be, as opposed to the Chumash Casino in California or the Cubans invade Oklahoma, 
because a casino is paying big money. That's another thing NBC I like about them. They refuse to let us have fights in hotel ball in casino ballrooms. They won't stand for it. They says do not put a fight in there where all we're going to see in the background is two customers, you know, toasting each other with their martinis. We want fans in the audience and Gypsy brought fans. He was a big drawing card, so for that reason I think he would get on TV. But, again, it it's, depends on the people buying the fights. Yeah, there, there's always a room for a showman like Gypsy, and he had talent to go. You know, you don't get off the floor to knock out Kitten Hayward or beat Curtis Cox from pillar to post in a non-title fight in the garden without having talent. Now, uh, Russell, is there one or two young guys out there that the, the boxing fans might not know that you could really say watch out for this guy because he's going to be uh, something special. I mean, you know, we see all the, the same guys being recycled on the premium networks, but uh, is, give us one or two really young names, unknowns, that uh, we that you think is going to blow up in the next year or two. Well, listen, I can only speak for what's around here. Uh, Jesse Hart, Cyclone Hart's son, is with Top Rank. He turned pro in Vegas on the Pacquiao show. He's fighting for me July 7th. He's got the size to grow into at least a light heavyweight. He's a big kid. He's got a great personality, and he's got talent. So I think he's going places. I like Ronald Cruz. Uh, I've, you know, Despite what he may or may not have looked like against Prentice Brewer, because I've seen his last 12 or 13 fights. But once again, I can only really – talk about the guys that I've seen because I don't get to see that many fights because honestly I'm disgusted with what's on television when I was a kid watching the Friday night fights and you only saw one fight you might see two if there was a knockout I was like glued to the TV set I mean glued to it like we'd go to parties with the girls and be dancing and when 10 o'clock would come around people would say where's Pelsa he's down in the recreation room watching the fights that's what I was like as a kid. So I can turn on ESPN now, and if it's not for Teddy Atlas, I'm walking around the room doing other work, and occasionally if there's a fight I want to see. But listen, you go to, we used to bet corners when we were kids. I'll take the blue corner, you take the red corner, whatever it was. You can pick the corner. You can, you can clean up. If they, had, if, you buy, if they were legalized boxing on the Friday night fights, you could clean up. You know who's going to win 90% of the fights that you see on television, you can pick them ahead of time, and it shouldn't be like that. You get a scorecard lineup when you go to the fights, and how many times do you see all the guys in one corner win? It's not accidental. Right. You know, Larry Hazard, the commissioner in Jersey, used to call it the sophisticated fix, where you just overmatch your fighter. And, and I'm disgusted with what I see. I mean, I know Freddie Hernandez is coming off a win over – Luis Colazzo, but does he deserve to fight Arisandi Lara on Showtime? Is that the main event? I'm not even sure if it's the main event. But does I he deserve that fight? Shouldn't it be Rosado in there or even Carlos Molina? Not that I like his style. Uh, I don't get it. I, I mean, I get it, but I don't get it. Wow, well, so, I mean, uh, yeah, and, uh, you know, these are all... Uh, elements that uh, you, you just long for the old days in a lot of ways. And uh, I mean, come on, Ronald Hearns, didn't he just fight Laura? Yes. Come on. I mean, he got knocked out by Harry Joe Yorgi, for God's sake. Ronald Hearns. I mean, and he and he gets. Uh, it, it, my wife says to me, "Don't you get the scourge?" I said, "Thank God for NBC Sports Network." Yeah, there you it's go. Just, you know. Now, uh, the, the last thing I want to ask you about in terms of uh, boxing from the past, it was the Blue Horizon. You mentioned it already. I used to love when they had fights on the USA Network there. Uh, unfortunately, it's it no longer. Uh, can you talk about you know, the importance and the history of that, and uh, will there ever be a comeback with the Blue Horizon? The Blue Horizon was the greatest fight club of its generation because um, – because we were able to make good fights in there. We just made good fights. I, uh, I, I tell this story often. One night, a, uh, one of the managers came up to me one night. It was like the fourth or fifth fight of the night, and every fight was Ollie Frazier. Every fight was like 
a Mike Tyson toe to toe battle, and and the kid said, the guy said to me, Russell, you haven't cut a break for one fighter on this show tonight. <laughs> What's with that? So I said, Alan, look at the crowd. You can't get in here. I never thought the day would come when we would be able to put two out of towners against each other in Philadelphia and turn people away. And people got so used to knowing that regardless of whether I was fighting my brother-in-law in the main event, we were going to sell out. We had a fight one night. Uh, Charles Brewer beat Frank Rhodes for the USBA title, and we announced our next show, which was eight weeks away, and we sold out the next day. And I said to Maureen, who works for me, I said, why? We don't even have to print posters. What's the point? You know, and we, we were on a roll like that. When USA discovered the Blue Horizon in 86, um, Dan Duva had a deal with USA, and he couldn't fulfill it. They were giving him $2,000 for a tape fight. So he said, why don't you take this off my hands? So I did the show, and Johnny Carter fought Juan Velos, and we got on TV, and then I did another one. And like a year later, I had my own contract with USA, and it ran basically from 1987 to when they went off in 1998. And uh, we had a streak there of probably 10 years where every single show sold out. Uh, and it was just... Uh, the fights were terrific. You 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 got to give the people good fights, and there's not enough. See, promoters today are not promoters; they're managers. They don't promote fights; they promote fighters. So when you're promoting fighters, you're going to give your you're going to try and give your guy an edge, and there's a thin line you've got to walk between being a manager and 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 satisfying the fans. And too many promoters don't walk that line. All they want is the W. And they get that W at the expense of the fans, so the middle class of boxing dies. If you're not on HBO or you're not on Showtime, nobody cares. People call the ESPN fights club fights. Well, they shouldn't be considered club fights because they should be the equivalent of the Friday night fights when I was a kid. But they're not. There's just too many fights there that nobody cares about. I know Teddy Atlas. Some people love him. Some people hate him. I love him. I know sometimes he's too negative, but on the other hand, nobody else that takes a stand. None of the other guys take a stand. They're too bland. So I watch ESPN for Teddy Atlas. I certainly don't watch it for the fights. So, wow. <laughs> you know, I, I, listen, I can't get in trouble because they're not buying my fights anyway. I, I so mean, it, it's amazing because I said that maybe two years ago on, on this show that, uh, you know, the only reason to watch and the reason why I watch is to hear Atlas and uh, you're saying the same thing. It's like, you know, really amazing. Yeah, but nobody wants to, nobody, everybody's afraid. Promoters call me up and they say, let's form a group. We're going to, we're going to boycott ESPN. We're going to go to somebody. And, and as soon as one of them gets a show, you don't hear from them anymore. They drop right. out. Right. You know, nobody wants to take a stand. They all... They all run and hide, but, you know, they have connections with networks and they get their fighters on. But all you have to do is look at Ronald Hearns against Lara to know it's just not right. I don't want to say fair because fair is like whining. It's just not right. And you right. know it and I know it and anybody with half a brain knows that there is no way in the world that Ronald Hearns should have gotten that fight. No way. Yeah. Well, uh, Russell, that I want to thank you for your time. You have the the fight card coming up July the seventh. Anything else you want to uh, tell us about that's on the the horizon for Pelt's box? No, that, that's uh, we're looking to go back to Bethlehem in September, maybe with another cruise, uh, Rosado doubleheader or Jennings cruise doubleheader. But uh, um, we're looking to extend the deal with NBC, more shows the next couple of years. It's 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 the uh, it's a it's a it's like a lighthouse in the fog, NBC Sports Network. So there's still hope. There's still hope out there that somebody in boxing can get it right. Listen, there's a lot of wonderful people in boxing, Don Chargan in California, that still make good fights. And, and there's good people out there that, that, that try. They're just not getting enough recognition, just like all the top referees are not in Nevada. You just see them more often. All the top trainers don't get on HBO. There's good trainers right here in Philly like Freddie Jenkins. Forget Nazim Richardson because he gets the recognition. Boogaloo Watts, the X-Fighter. There's good trainers in all the cities, 
but there's a lot of good fighters out there that aren't getting exposure, and the networks need to wake up because they're not doing enough to uh, they're not doing enough for the for the power they possess in this business. Just remember, number one power broker in this business is HBO. Boxing's in trouble. So let's look at the number one power broker. What can they do to help the sport? They got to do more than they're doing. They got to do more. All right, uh, Jay Russell Peltz, uh, great stuff. Thank you for all your honesty, and uh, I'll give you the final word. No, listen, I love boxing. It's been my mistress since I was 12 years old. I just don't like what people have been doing to it in recent years. It's not the sport I grew up with and fell in love with as a kid, but we got to keep trying. It'll get better. It's big in Europe. It's big in Mexico. It's big in the Orient. we got to get it big again in the United States. All right, and we'll keep looking for the great stuff you've been giving us on NBC Sports Network, and uh, we'll, we'll keep an eye on that uh, promising card on July 7th, uh, middle middle class, like you said, but should be, provide a lot of action for us, and uh, I'd love to talk to you again. Okay, it was a pleasure. All right, pleasure was all Thank ours. You. Thank you. Jay Russell Peltz, and uh, you know th- th- that's about as straight talk as you could get, and uh, we'll be back right after this. <laughs> 